GM of the Minnesota Vikings, was there for 16 years. 19 players drafted during his tenure made at least one Pro Bowl. It is Rick Spielman. Rick, thanks for coming on. How have you been? Uh, great. Uh, appreciate you having me on today. I got a few uh, days here to kind of relax. Uh, got an opportunity to do a lot of media stuff right now. So uh, it, it's, I really appreciate you uh, having me on and look forward to our conversation. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's always interesting to get a, a GM's perspective on stuff going on around the NFL and just the inner workings, because you guys don't do that much during the season, right? We don't really get to talk to you. Well, and stuff I don't like know that. if I would put it that way. <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> going on during the season that isn't uh, seen in the media. Right. No, there's a million things going on, but we don't really get to talk to you that much. We, there are not many, I guess media stuff that go on and it's usually the coach every single day and stuff like that but obviously there's a lot going on we'll talk about what goes on day to day for a GM let, let me start off with this because I think the team that many people are keeping a very close eye on this offseason is the Denver Broncos and their GM George Payton was with you in Chicago was with you in Miami and then was with you all those years in Minnesota there might not be a football person who knows George more than you. Um, let me start simple. What do you think of what he's done so far in Denver? He just hired Nathaniel Hackett to be his coach. He drafted Patrick Sertain with his first round pick last year, and he looks to be like a stud. Um, traded Von Miller for a two and a three expiring contract. How do you think his roster building and decision making has been so far there in Denver? Well, I think Denver made a great hire with George. Uh, he was more than ready probably had some other opportunities earlier, but decided to wait on the right opportunity. And Denver definitely fit that. It's a great organization. Um, and he got an opportunity to go in there and put his stamp on that. Now he's an excellent personnel man, uh, very patient, very diligent uh, before he makes decisions uh, to have everybody uh, collaborating in on that decision. Uh, he's an excellent people skills type person, so he can get along with everybody and he's, he knows what he's doing. So I thought he made a great hire in Nathaniel Hackett. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what direction they go, but so far, everything he's done out there, I thought he's done a phenomenal job. Yeah. You know, you mentioned something very interesting and, it, and it's true. The thing about George and people who follow this stuff very closely would know George was sought out by teams for years and he kept on rejecting interviews, rejecting potential opportunities. And he kept on sticking around the Minnesota and waiting for the right place to come to him. I wanted to ask you, like, why do you think he picked Denver? Because it's a division with Rogers and I mean, with Mahomes and, and Herbert, that team is going to be sold. There'll be new ownership. And what made him go there after rejecting so many other places? Well, we, we had a lot of talks and we're more than co-workers, uh, yeah. we're very close friends. I'm the godfather of his son. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we've been together all those years, but I've always told him, George, that you're going to get your opportunity. Uh, we've had enough success here in Minnesota that people are going to want to interview you and you're going to have your choice. And that's impatient uh, with a lot of people because it's always been, when can I be a GM, regardless of the situation? And I think he weighed all the positives and negatives in a lot of the places that he went to. And when he called me, I'll never forget when he called me uh, the night he was going to accept the Denver Broncos job, he said, this is, a, this is something that I know is going to be a right fit for me, a right fit for my family, which is also critical. And I knew then uh, that this was the time for him to go. Yeah. And, you know, that roster in Denver, I mean, top to bottom, there are so many young, great pieces there. But the big question everyone is asking about in Denver is the quarterback position. And you might have heard about this guy named Aaron Rodgers. Um, he's pretty good. was in your division. Um, pretty good at what he does. And everyone is linking him to Denver if he decides he wants to leave. Let me ask you, what do you think happens with Aaron? And is George going to pull the trigger if it gets to that point? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm not in those meetings. I think the biggest thing that he's prior prioritizing right now is getting the coach in, getting that staff together. I think when you're going through these type of decisions, you have to look at all your options. Uh, a new coach coming in is going to have a fresh set of eyes on everything. And what is that new coach's philosophy? I mean, Aaron Rodgers, he's a future Hall of Famer and maybe 
one of the best that has ever played the game. There's no question about that. But you don't know the availability. Um, are there options that they will look at in the draft? And with a new coach coming in and a new regime out in Denver, uh, do they go young and start from square one? Uh, do they look at those options? So you're not going to be able to make those decisions yet. You don't even know if you have an opportunity to trade for him. He's still under contract with the Green Bay Packers, and I'm sure they're going to do everything in their power to keep him there. So you have to assess everything uh, on what direction you want to go, especially at the quarterback position. Yeah, I mean, he's going to be the hot button topic once again here this offseason. Again, when you look at just the way this roster has been set up with young talent like Javante Williams and Cortland Sutton, Judy, Patrick Fant, the offensive line is above average. Hiring his offensive coordinator won't hurt at all. I mean, they have all their picks, including two twos and two threes. They've positioned themselves to at least be in the market for one of the big names if George decides to go in that direction. Um, your team, the Vikings, um, they won the NFC North four times despite Aaron being there, which is um, a pretty big deal. I mean, it's having in a Hall of Fame quarterback there, usually the top quarterback is the guy you're going after for Minnesota to win it four years, I think is, um, is a testament to the work you did of that roster. But is it going to bother you a little bit if Aaron is traded the first year you're no longer there? No, it doesn't bother me at all. But what I'm learning is doing a lot of this media stuff and doing these type of interviews that uh, there's a lot of speculation out there, which drives, a, which keeps the game very interesting, even during the off season. So once we get off these playoffs in the, in the Super Bowl, then it's how you're going to get your team better. And every fan for every team is going to watch closely, whether it's through the draft, whether it's through free agency, whether it's through trades. So uh, that's what makes this game so great because it's not does not end at the end of the season. It continues on through the off season. You're always continuing to build your roster. So there will be a lot of topics of discussion, I imagine, coming up this off season. I mean, you have Russell Wilson out there. Is he staying in Seattle? Um, you know, how do these quarterbacks or one of these quarterbacks going to coming out in the draft? even though they may not be rated as high right now, but we have such a long way to go until draft uh, with the senior bowl coming up uh, with all the pro days. One of these guys are going to emerge. And then which one is it? Because I bet you if you went back and looked uh, the year like a Mahomes came out, I don't know if people had him, we know where he went, but by the time everybody got through the process, the interview process, the workout, Kansas City, did a great job and moved and traded up and got Mahomes. But I don't think, you know, if you would have looked at Joe Burrow uh, coming out of his junior year or Zach Wilson coming out of his junior year at BYU, then all of a sudden they had great senior years and then it starts jockeying. So there's so much out there that has to be answered yet that, um, and that's what's going to make it a fascinating offseason, especially for teams that do need quarterbacks. Yeah, you know, the thing, let's stick to the quarterback position here for a second, because, you know, there are so many teams who have the top tier guys. Not so, there, there are a number of teams who have the top tier guys, and there's like the middle tier guys. When it comes to the quarterback position, do you feel like the league is trending in a direction where if you don't have one of the Allen, Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, you have the right to look around for an upgrade? Because it, it feels like the patience with a young guy is not what it once was. So if you have a, Tua and a Daniel Jones or a Jalen Hurts, just to name a few. I mean, should you be looking at least this offseason to see if you get one of the bigger names? I think every team is always going to evaluate every position. And if there are opportunities out there to improve your roster, regardless of position. And, you know, the big question is, do you need a Patrick Mahomes or a Josh Allen or the way Matthew Stafford's playing? Uh, right now for the LA Rams do you need that to win a Super Bowl and that's where teams are internally after the season are going to assess where they're at they have to assess where their salary cap is they have to assess the team needs and how we're going to fill those needs and the biggest question that they're going to be talking amongst themselves with the personnel and with the coaching staff and even with ownership is can we win a Super Bowl with this quarterback and if not, then what's your plan and what's your options? Because if you get rid of someone too soon, 
then all of a sudden you're starting back and you've set your franchise back farther. So do you think the guy that you can can win games as long as you have a strong defense around them, as long as you have a solid running game? Uh, and this guy can go out there and I won't call him a game manager, but can make some plays to help you win games? Or do you need to try to take a swing at defense and uh, try to hit on a Patrick Mahomes or a Josh Allen? Because there was a lot of questions on Josh coming out as well. Yeah. And uh, I thought uh, Buffalo and that coaching staff up there have done a phenomenal job developing these guys, Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy and uh, all those guys on that staff and what they've done with Mahomes. But in Mahomes' situation, he had an opportunity to sit for a year uh, up behind Alex Smith. So he didn't have to get thrown into the fire right away. Uh, you know, Josh Allen went in and struggled his rookie year. But it takes time. There's not a magic pixie dust that you can sprinkle on that position. They have to gain experience because it's such a different game when you get up to this level. Uh, and when you're judging these quarterbacks, uh, you're trying to judge them by how they respond in critical situations during the game, because a lot of quarterbacks cannot have a great game, but all of a sudden it's the fourth quarter. What's their quarterback rating when they're behind by seven? Uh, when it's third down, do they rise to those type of occasions or are they better when it's a lead and they don't have much pressure on them and then their stats are great? But all of a sudden, when it's crunch time in a critical situation in the game, how do they respond? So those are the things that as you're evaluating these guys and you're evaluating each team's evaluating their quarterback position, that those are the type of questions that are going to come up in meetings. Yep, and those meetings are going on right now across the league in every building for those teams who have those type of quarterbacks. The biggest storyline right now around the NFL is all these head, co head coach vote vacancies, right? There are nine of them this year, which is, I believe, the most since 2009. Finally, it's starting to fill up around the NFL. Do you feel like, you know, we just talked about all these quarterbacks and these head coaches who are offensive minded. Do you feel like we're getting to a point in the NFL where teams should strongly consider hiring an offensive minded guy who will have a strong relationship with the quarterback or stick to the way it always was? Forget about all that. Let's just get the best guy for the job. I think that the, the teams are trending towards offensive minded coaches, but I still think that you have to get the best head coach for your situation because every team's situation is different. Do you have a veteran roster? Do you have a young roster? What does your team need in that leader uh, in a head coach? So, you know, when we hired Coach Zimmer, he did a phenomenal job. That's what our team needed. And we improved on defense. We had a philosophy on how we were going to win games. And that was eight years ago. And we had a, a great run under Coach Zimmer. Uh, but every year, trends change. The number, I do believe that the head coach and a quarterback have to have that relationship in order to be successful. But if you have a strong defensive coach, then look and see who his offensive coordinator is because if you're able to get a good offensive coordinator that can develop that quarterback and make him successful, well, more than likely that offensive coordinator is going to get an opportunity to be a head coach down the road. So it's a trendy league. Uh, a lot of guys are looking at offense now. I went back and did a study, and I think the last time two defensive coaches faced each other in a Super Bowl was when Bill Belichick and Dan Quinn played against each other. Now, they had great offensive coordinators and Josh McDaniels and Kyle Shanahan, great quarterbacks and Matt Ryan and Tom Brady. And if you look after that Super Bowl, take out Brady and Belichick, most of the other coaches were offensive coaches. Interesting. That's a, that's an interesting study there. So, um, you know, you've hired a couple of coaches during your time as GM. You mentioned Mike Zimmer. Could you just, I guess, peel back the curtain for a little bit? Like what goes on during these interviews? Do you talk to your players about who they would want as a head coach? You know, we see all these requests. We see the private jets and dinners and eight, nine hour meetings. What are those conversations about? Like, are we doing X's and O's? Is it about impressing the owner? Like what goes on during those meetings to try to find the head coach? I think each team has to know what they're looking for in a head coach, and that can be different. An example that I can give, maybe uh, 
if you're looking at a nose tackle in the draft and he's a three, four, which means an odd front defense, mm -hmm. and he's going to have to basically hold the point in the run game. And that's all his job's going to have to do. If you try to put him in a one gap scheme defense where he has to utilize his quickness to get upfield and penetrate gaps to disrupt things in the backfield. Well, he has a totally different skill set. And if you put him in the wrong defensive scheme, he's probably not going to be as effective as if you put him in the right scheme. So I think when you're going through and, you, and you're interviewing these head coaches, uh, when I went through and we hired Coach Zimmer, I talked to 46 of our players and asked them if they were in the position to hire a head coach, what were the traits that you would look for for our team? And I got a sense and a feel for what our players were looking for, uh, along with our ownership, listening to a lot of those uh, ideas that players had. And, and But there was one common theme that Coach Zimmer brought to us was that he wanted to hold the players accountable both on and off the field. And that's exactly what our players wanted. There was no question about his defensive genius, I would say, uh, because we've always had a really, really good defense. Mm -hmm. And then we married up on offense. What do we want to be on offense? And we want to be able to run the ball. We wanted to be able to play action pass to make big plays off establishing a run game. And we wanted to control the clock, the time of possession. Mm -hmm. So that's how we kind of built our roster under Coach Zimmer. Um, but everything, like it says, evolves and changes. And then you watch the buff, you watch all these games this past weekend. And you watch the Buffalo uh, Kansas City game and Buffalo, I thought Leslie Frazier has done an outstanding job as their defensive coordinator. And I think they had the top rated defense, if I'm not mistaken, in the yeah. NFL. But all of a sudden you get into a buzzsaw in Kansas City and Patrick Mahomes is rolling and all those skilled players with all that speed, um, their defense got exposed uh, in that playoff game, even though they played great throughout the year. So those are things, you know, besides all the questions and they'll have, you know, 11 pages of questions and philosophies and things. But I think each team that's hiring a head coach really has to hone in on what coach is going to fit their team the best. Yeah, Ben, again, these teams are now finally filling up these vacancies slowly but surely. It's definitely been slower this year. I mean, there are a number of reasons for that, but we're getting there with all these vacancies. I've asked this question here to um, several GMs, former and current, and, you know, we see Dan Quinn was back in the coaching cycle. Doug Peterson was in the cycle. Mike McCarthy got a second job last year. Adam Gase got a second job. Why is it so rare for GMs to get a second chance compared to a head coach? You know, I don't know. I think that um, you, you, the, each owner, uh, as they put a GM in place, is looking for something maybe different. I think it's it's the NFL has done a great job, at, and you're seeing a lot more minority candidates getting an opportunity which they they deserve. And there's a lot of great bright minds out there, and. Um, everybody's philosophy is different. So unless you're sitting in that meeting with that owner or have a thought or know the thoughts of what the ownership group is talking about, you don't know. But I think there's a lot of bright-minded, young, talented talent evaluators out there, and they are starting to get their opportunity to, to show if they can do the job or not. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I asked this question also to Thomas Dimitrov, and I think one of the things that we, we mentioned is kind of that, um, you know, the head coaches, if you're fired, you just go back to be an OC or a DC. And if you have one good year, you're right back in the cycle. As for a GM, you're kind of put somewhere else, possibly in a different front office, but we don't really get to see you much. And that's where it kind of gets lost in the shuffle. But it's a discussion that I've had with several other people and um, everyone has a different answer. It's a diff it's, it's very interesting topic, definitely that we could delve into um, more deeply at a different time. I also asked this question to Thomas Dimitrov last week here on the show. And I wanted to ask you this as well. You know, there are a lot of Twitter tough guys out there, you know, people who think they could do the GM job, what would you say is one of the most misunderstood things that fans maybe just don't understand that goes on as a GM? Well, I think there are a couple points on that the fans don't understand out there. It's not just personnel. 
It's dealing with situations every day that, that you don't anticipate when you go into that office, whether it's a player issue, uh, an off-field issue, uh, you're overseeing not only the personnel department, but every other department under football ops on whatever way that organization is structured. So I know me personally, I did a lot of other things. And the only time I got into personnel was towards the end of the week when I was able to start doing some college stuff and going out and watching college games. But you deal with so many different things that come across your desk during the day. And I always wanted to make sure if I can handle them and keep them off the head coach's desk, but keep the head coach informed of what's going on, that he can truly focus on, hey, you got to get this team ready to play on Sunday and whatever you have to do to get there. But team, uh, people on the outside don't see that. The other part of, that I think is very important is when you're going through all these decisions in the off season, you're trying to reach uh, a collaborative effort to come up with the best decision for the organization. So when we're sitting in meetings, uh, I'm sitting in there with the scouts and then we bring the coaches in, uh, you bring the ownership in, you bring your cap guy in. So you're balancing a lot of things that are going on and trying to come up with a decision that you can get everybody as best you can on the same page. The other thing that fans don't see out there is, well, why didn't you take this guy in a draft? Or why didn't you go sign this guy in free agency? It's because they don't have all the information that we have as far as medical history, as far as some of the background stuff that we have done that may not be out there public. Uh, all the sources that we have talked to, the schematic fit, so there's so many other ancillary things that go into that decision before you decide to either sign a player as a free agent, trade for a player, uh, draft a player, that the fans will never know the research behind it. And a lot of that research will never come to light. You know, you mentioned all this research that you do with your team. When it comes to the draft and free agency as a GM, how do you balance the needs versus best available, especially when each player, as you said, will not fit every scheme? So while the fan could be screaming from the rooftop to take him, you know, for your coaching staff, this guy doesn't fit. How do you balance through all that? Those are what, the, those are what you do inside those meetings. And uh, it's, a, it's a fine line on how you balance that. You know, I, I remember my first draft with the Minnesota Vikings. And we had a running back when I had come in there that they had signed a year or two before Chester Taylor, who was having thousand yard seasons. That wasn't a need going into that draft. But when Adrian Peterson was sitting there, when we selected, how can you not take an Adrian Peterson? So you have to balance out in the, you know, how we developed our draft board, which is a whole nother discussion is that I made sure that once we got through with our coaches and all our personnel scouts, that we had options if we felt that a guard, a defensive end, a defensive safety all had the same value on where they were on the board. As long as they were in that same category and same value, then we would take a need. But we would never say you needed an offensive guard. And the best offensive guard that was developed on your board was a category down. Well, you're not going to pass those players that you decided were better, were going to be better NFL players. So you balance without getting too complicated a need, but you have to give yourself enough options if there are options in different positions so you can potentially fill those needs in the draft. Right. And I feel like that's also something that fans just don't realize. Like, this isn't like baseball where you just trade for a first baseman, you plug him into first base. I mean, each position is different from team to team and scheme to scheme around the NFL. You know, you've seen thousands upon thousands of players on film and in person. Who would you say is like the one player who just blew you away when you were evaluating him, evaluating him? Could be someone you drafted or somebody else, but over the years, is there somebody that you were watching when you went down there over the weekend? You were like, wow. Yeah, I would say, I, I, 
you know, been in the business over 30 years and seen a lot of great players. And uh, that was a, that was hard. That's a hard question to say this one, but I would say the player that stuck out to me the most that not only was a unique athlete, but maybe a generation type player, but also loved the game just as much as how good he was on the field and how he approached it. And I would say that would be Adrian Peterson, mm-hmm. uh, who I think is a, a, a once in a generation type running back. I know they, at the time, they were trying to compare him to the Eric Dickersons of the world, who I believe is in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. But Adrian Peterson was probably the one who was the, with his size and with his freak athletic ability and speed for his size, but he also had such passion to play football. And when you can find a player that's very good and he loves playing the game, that's what makes a future Hall of Famer. Do you ever think about, does it like blow your mind that he was still playing this past year? I mean, he was drafted the first year you were there, or second year you were there in Minnesota, and he's still playing now. Yeah, it was my first year. And no, it doesn't shock me because I remember Adrian coming off his torn ACL and the next year had his, I believe, his MVP. most productive year as a yeah. pro because of what is in his heart and what is in his mind and what makes him such a great player. Yeah, but it's unreal. I mean, it sounds like he still wants to keep on going, which is just unreal for a running back who has taken that many hits. I mean, you're a running back. It's basically running into a car crash every single play and still going and still playing, which is unbelievable. You made a trade a couple of years ago that is one of the most win-win trades the NFL has ever had. You, you traded Stefan Diggs to Buffalo for a package that included a first-round pick, turned out to be Justin Jefferson. Let me start with the Diggs side. I mean, was that a, a very difficult thing to do? Because I remember you were so consistent that we're not going to trade him, we're not going to trade him. I know you have to say that, but there was so much <laughs> drama. But this is a number one receiver who you just paid. I mean, was pulling the trigger on that deal a difficult thing to do or was just time to move on? Like, how is that for you? I mean, I'll never forget. You kept on going on a bunch of different shows, talking to reporters, and you were just consistent as could be that it's not going to happen. And then, boom, it happened the same day as Hopkins, Buckner, and then Diggs happened at night. So it was a wild day. But take us back to when that happened. Yeah, no, uh, you know, we were very fortunate to get Stefan Diggs in the fifth round where we drafted yeah. him. And he is a premier, if not the best, one of the best receivers in the league. Uh, So that was a very difficult decision. I had a lot of discussions with him and his agent uh, as well. Uh, And sometimes when you get to a point, you have to make a decision. If you're going to trade somebody like that, you know, how are you going to replace them? And what type of value do you put on him in a trade? And I know Buffalo was looking for a number one receiver for Josh Allen. Uh, it just happened. Uh, it, it's amazing how deals just out of the blue start coming together. Mm-hmm. And this one came together and we thought we had great value. But what another thing fans don't realize is, okay, you traded Stefan Diggs. Now what? Well, right. things don't happen instantly during the off season. Uh, you can go into free agency and, and I'll get into that on another time on how you weigh in draft and free agency and how you make those decisions. But we were very fortunate that we were able to land Justin Jefferson. And I think he is, he's a phenomenal receiver right now. And he's even going to be better as he continues uh, on his, on his path. Yeah. Could you just go back to that draft night? Um, it was a virtual draft. The consensus top three receivers were off the board and then Philadelphia passed on him for a different receiver, which shocked everyone. What was your reaction when they passed on him and then you realized that Justin fell to number 22 to you? Yeah, no, on, on draft night, uh, you can prepare all you want. Right. And, uh, but you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if someone's going to trade ahead of you and all of a sudden, hey, we're going to get player A and then team A from the bottom come up and take him right before you're getting ready to take him. So you have to weigh all those type of options. And sometimes the draft just falls your way. I wish I can say I had like mind control that says, say, hey, have this guy fall to 22 and we'll get take him there. You know, even last year when we uh, traded back and still got 
uh, Christian Darasaw, who I think is going to be an excellent left tackle in this league. Mm -hmm. uh, we're able to still land him and add some more picks, but it was one of those occasions where everything had just come together and we, you know, we got value for, for uh, Stefan Diggs and we were able to replace him with Justin Jefferson. Yeah. So you, you drafted Jefferson, you drafted Diggs in the fifth round, you drafted some big time names there at that position. What are some of the non-negotiables or some of the traits that a wide receiver must have for you to select him? Because well, it feels like well, it feels like that position is one more thing. Every year it just gets deeper and deeper, and there's such a large pool. So how do you? What's the determining factor in picking who you're going to get? There, there's a lot of um, determining factors that will go into that decision, and a lot of times, you know, because I've made mistakes too. Um, and you go back, and I always been an after action review guy, an AAR, uh, which I learned from the military is when you do select a player and he doesn't work out, why didn't he work out? And dive into that, find out what went wrong with that decision, whether it was a physical thing, was it a mental thing, was it an off-field thing, was it a psychological thing, and then make sure you don't make that same mistake twice. So sometimes, even though you never, ever want to fail, you're never, ever going to be perfect in the selections that you make, but... I always felt it was very important if you do miss on a player, find out the reason why so you don't make that same mistake twice. Other part that has come into play has been the analytics side of it. And we had a great analytics department led by Scott Kuhn, who was the director of our analytics. And they were able, as we evolved over the last four or five years, come up not only with the physical traits, not only at receiver, but each position, but what their intelligence scores had to be and what their mental makeup had to be, whether it was self-efficacy, whether it was coachability, well, it was effective commitment, was a combative attitude for a linebacker, let's say. So we were able to weigh in with all the algorithms that they were creating, what was the most important because they went and back tested everything. And we got to the point almost where we're able to clone guys now that have come out in the past that could potentially be someone similar to who you're getting ready to select. Interesting. So that's that's a very fascinating thing you just mentioned there. And, you know, I wanted to ask you this because it, it seemed like, and you kind of just mentioned it, you were very into studies and looking for edges in technology. Is there anything specific that you've become very aware of and think is in the future of the NFL as the sport continues to evolve? I think there are, it, are a lot of things that I, I was becoming aware of. You know, uh, how does virtual reality, and I talked about this on another show, come a piece of this. And we were really big in trying to evaluate uh, how virtual reality, especially at the quarterback position, uh, can, can help that position. Um, but, you know, then COVID hit, so we had limitations on who can come in the building, and we kind of had to make some a few uh, change of directions, as most teams right. did, as we dealt with the... Uh, COVID over the last couple of years. But I think as technology evolves in whatever area, you know, even in sports science with the GPS tracking, how do you apply that? Um, there is so much new coming out and we're evolving so much that teams are going to start looking at all this new technology and trying to figure out if there is a way to give them a competitive advantage. And I think that's when you're a GM, uh, you have to look at all that different technology that's out there. And then you have to rely, because I'm not going to be able to tell you if, you know, you put a chip in my shoulder pad, I don't know what's that going to tell me, but you have to have people with knowledge of that subject matter and have them explain if we do this, or we go with this technology, this, how it could benefit us. Or I've seen six of these and all six have failed. So we don't want to go down this road with this technology. So you have to be really open-minded. You have to have people in their areas of expertise uh, evaluate all this new technology that's coming out. And then if they do find something that could potentially give you a competitive advantage, you have to, you have to, to look at it and maybe apply it to what you're doing. 
Yeah, we could probably do a whole episode on just some of these things that you guys have looked into. And there are a lot of deep thinking stuff that have been gone on. And again, I mentioned Thomas here a few times, but I spoke to him about that as well last week. And he was also very into those things as well. Two more things here before I wrap this up. League-wide, when you were the GM, the Vikings were always considered one of the better cap management teams. And you had Rob Zinski, who is widely respected handling the cap in Minnesota. What would you say are some of the challenges that are presented when you're up against the cap? Let's say a team like the Saints. Like, yes, you can maneuver and kick it down to the future years, but what obstacles arise with that? I think you have to look at, and we've always looked at, we're going to be able to get enough cap room. It's going to be how you do your accounting to make sure that you're in compliance with whatever the cap number is. But eventually, if you kick the can is what we used to call it, if you take out some money and push money out into future years, um, how's that going to affect your roster? And we always try to make sure that any move or any type of structure we had in contracts, that it would not tie our hands or inhibit us inhibit us from being able to potentially sign uh call or assign uh, unrestricted free agents but more importantly is we were very honed in on hopefully hitting on players on the draft and we did numerous deals on extending those players because those are the players you know the best and i think the last one we did was last year uh with brian o'neill our our right offensive tackle. And I just saw the other day uh, that he just got put into the Pro Bowl. So you're always trying to not only understand what your cap situation is this year, but if you do X, Y, and Z with these contracts this year, how's it going to affect your cap in future years? And if you have a Dalvin Cook or the next big one, I imagine it's going to become up, is Justin Jefferson. When his contract, are you going to be so cap stricken that you can't sign him, or are you going to have the flexibility to maneuver so you make sure you don't lose a Justin Jefferson? All right. So it's always looking ahead as well if you're capping. Of course, COVID threw everybody off the rails. But um, again, another topic. That, that like, was the biggest challenge that I didn't yeah, mean to set you off. Yeah. Is because when we were cap planning and signing our deals, the cap was supposed to be at X. But when COVID hit and they reduced the cap, that put a lot of teams in scramble mode. Right, because every team is expecting it to go up 10 million every year. And for it to go down by 10, it's basically going down by 20 from what you're projecting. And Correct. it threw everybody off. And um, just thinking about teams like New Orleans last offseason, everyone said you could fix it. Yeah, there are ways to fix it, but they lost a bunch of key players there. Last one here, and you've been really generous with your time. You know, Minnesota was in three overtime games this past year. We just saw what happened with Buffalo and Kansas City. Should the NFL consider anything with this overtime rules, maybe just for the playoffs? Where do you stand on this hot topic button right now? Yeah, I I, I believe they have to look at these overtime rules. And the reason why is because of what you saw in Kansas City. And should Buffalo have had another opportunity uh, to touch the ball? I think, in my opinion, whether it's you know, what will go to the competition committee and what will come out. There may be two sets of rules, one for the regular season and one for the postseason. Because in a regular season, you have to take in player safety and you have to take in that 17th game. Uh, And if you lose in overtime, you get a chance to play the following week. In the playoffs, it's a totally different scenario. Most of those teams are the elite teams that have elite quarterbacks. And is it fair for both teams not to touch the ball? And if you lose in a playoff, you don't have another week to play. So I think they may, I would look at it two different ways. Is it we okay and how it worked out in the regular season? And then look at it in the postseason. And I read a stat uh, last week that I think 140 plus games have been in overtime, including regular season and playoffs. The team that got the ball first only one or one 52% or 53% of the time. But in the playoffs, it was 10 to one or seven of those 10 teams that touched the ball the first time actually won the game. So how do you level that playing field out? Right. I mean, again, it was just the playoffs, like you mentioned, the top tier quarterbacks are the ones that are left. 
give them the ball first, the chance of them scoring, as you mentioned in that stat, is very high. And I believe the number is right. It's 10 and 1 is the record for the team touches the ball first in the playoffs. We'll see what they do here this offseason. But um, a lot of a lot of topics that we just discussed here will be um, heavily discussed here this offseason from Aaron Rodgers to the overtime rules. All right, Rick, I really want to thank you for taking the time here today. I could go on and on, but this was some great stuff. A lot of knowledge, and um, hopefully we could do it again down the line. Look forward to it. Thanks for having me on.